Windows 3.1 needs no introduction whatsoever. When its predecessor, Windows 3.0, came around and radically transformed the user interface, Windows 3.1 perfected it. And when Windows for Word groups came around, things only got better from here. Features such as file sharing, print servers, peer-to-peer -peer networking, and actually being able to browse the internet with the support of TCP IP were available as of version 3.11. This was arguably the point where Windows was slowly becoming the operating system people have come to know and love over the years. Frankly speaking, I think that this version of Windows could be considered a definitive edition, per se, of Windows 3.1. Three years ago, we published an installation guide for Windows for Workgroups 3.11, outlining hardware choices, the installation process, network setup, and more. However, several problems have arisen with it ever since. For one, it was three years ago, and 86 box was a completely different beast back then. This was before the version 3.0 days, when we had a messy machine list, we were still exclusively on Windows, and we had just gotten started on our Pentium 2 emulation. Let's just say we've come a long way since. And two, it's 45 minutes long. With those factors in mind, I came to the following conclusion. That which is old must be made new again. Let's start with hardware choices, bearing in mind that this machine should accommodate most, if not all, of our needs. Graphical fidelity, sound quality, networking, hard drive space, you name it. Oh, and of course, since quite a few games of the era came on CD-ROM, this is a must. The Soyo 4 SAW2 is a board that can offer just that and so much more. It's a 486 motherboard that supports CD-ROM booting at the hardware level, which means you could go as far as installing versions of Windows such as NT4.0 much more easily. CD boot is inconsequential here given the age of the operating system we're dealing with, but knowing that the BIOS itself does support CD-ROM is a plus. We will be going with a 33MHz i486DX and 16MB of RAM, the memory amount here being the most Windows for Workgroups 3.11 can handle. You could go further with the CPU choice, such as a 486DX2, IDX4, or Pentium Overdrive, so long as your computer can handle the extra speed. Now, whether you choose to enable the Dynamic Recompiler, or Dynarec as it's often called, is up to you, but be advised that it does impact performance to a degree, so we'll leave that off for now. In all my experiments, the Diamond Stealth 64 VRAM, based on the S3 Vision 964 chipset, has proven to be a reliable graphics card that can display up to 1152 by 864 at full true color with only 4 megabytes of VRAM. So, how about we go with that one? The mouse, as per usual on those machines, is a two-button Microsoft serial mouse connected to COM1. The sound card is the industry standard Sound Blaster 16, with the default settings shown on screen. MIDI out device is System MIDI, though you could choose something like the Roland MT32 if you're not on Windows. By the way, leave Float32 sound enabled. Now, because this is Windows for workgroups, which implies there's a significant networking component, what good is it if we don't have a network adapter? we have plans to connect to the internet anyway. The Realtek RTL 8029AS is our card of choice here, as it's compatible with a wide range of Windows versions and is easy to set up. Select Slurp as the mode and choose the Realtek 8029 card. 
Enabling the BIOS is not required for the card to function. Now, this is optional, but a few people in the comments section of the previous Windows for Workgroups 3.11 video strongly recommended that I install a printer driver to be able to use true type fonts, which were introduced in Windows 3.1. After much testing, I discovered that the printer that works best in our scenario is the NEC ColorMade PS40. And in the ports common LPT section, the printer can be enabled by setting LPT1 device to generic postscript printer. Storage controllers. Make sure the hard drive and floppy controllers are both set to internal. There is no need to use SCSI here unless we're using Windows NC 3.1, which we're not doing, so move along. Now for hard drives. I decided to go somewhat ballistic and opt for a dual 504 megabyte hard drive configuration, mainly for the sake of dedicating one of the two hard drives to games or additional software. You could of course just go with one hard drive if you so desire. Both hard drives are on an IDE controller, the first one being on channel 00 and the second being on 01. We'll be using our usual 3.5 inch 1.44 megabyte and 5.25 inch 1.2 megabyte floppy drive combo as usual, and the CD-ROM drive with a speed of 16x will go in channel 10 on the ATAPI bus. And now that we're finished configuring our machine's hardware, it's time to power it on. After spamming delete at the boot screen, as usual, choose standard CMOS setup. This will take you to a screen where you can change the date, time, hard drive, and floppy drive configuration. In the hard disk section, set everything except secondary slave to auto. In the floppy disk section, set drive A to 3.5 inch 1.44 megabytes and drive B to 5.25 inch 1.2 megabytes, these being the values we set earlier. The BIOS features setup screen is where you would usually change your boot sequence so that you could, for instance, boot from a floppy, CD-ROM, or just your hard drive. Since we're not going to be using any bootable CDs during the installation process, leave the boot sequence as is. A, C, SCSI. Now that we're done with the BIOS, one thing I usually do before I exit is to insert the first disk of the MS-DOS installation media I'll be using. We'll be using MS-DOS version 6.22. After inserting your disk, save all changes and exit the BIOS. Your machine will automatically restart. Now you're in MS-DOS setup, which is fairly simple. Here, MS-DOS setup will format both of your hard drives and ask you to confirm a few things before installation. You'll just be presented with descriptions of a few MS-DOS features throughout the installation process. And of course, once the process is complete, remove any disks from your floppy drives and restart. Now that we have a fully working MS-DOS installation, it's time to set up the CD-ROM drive. We'll be installing MS-DOS CD-ROM extensions, better known as MS-CDEX version 2.23 with Acer's custom VIDE CDD driver, which you can find on our 86 Box Essentials website along with the rest of the drivers we'll be using throughout this video. Insert the MS-CDEX 2.23 installer floppy disk, switch to the A drive in DOS, and type in install. This is also fairly easy, just note the directory where the drivers are going to be installed. After the installation, copy the custom driver to your hard drive. Type in the following line in the command prompt. Now we need to edit config.sys on the hard drive for the driver to load. Type in edit c colon slash config.sys to open config.sys in the MS-DOS editor. At the line that starts with device high, change the CD-ROM driver from gscdrom.sys to vcdd215.sys and remove the slash v switch at the very end of the line. Save the file and reboot your system. You should now see that the new driver has loaded and you can now access CDs in MS-DOS. Now it's finally time to install Windows. Insert disk 1 of the Windows for Workgroups 3.11 installation media, switch to the A drive, and type in setup. Setup at this stage is relatively simple. You'll want to choose custom setup to ensure every piece of hardware has been correctly detected and that you'll be installing Windows exactly where you want it. Don't bother changing anything here, especially the display adapter, as this will be taken care of after setup. From there, you'll be switching disks in and out until you reach the graphical part of setup, 
which should happen right about now. Also, you don't need a product number to install a Windows, at least this version anyway. In the optional task window, uncheck everything except for setup printers and then click continue. And we're back to switching disks in and out again. At the end of this mind-numbing process, we reach the printer installation prompt. In the list of printers below, choose any C color made PS40. From all the information I was able to gather online, it's a decent color postscript printer from the early 90s with very clean printer output. After selecting the printer, click install, do some more disk switching, and the printer should now be installed on port LPT1. Again, don't worry about setting up networking now, as this will be handled after setup. Let setup take care of those files, as no changes will be made to the CD-ROM configuration we did earlier. Wait, you, you don't know how to use a mouse in the year 2023? And setup is now complete. Time to restart, type when to start Windows, and here we are. So, as you can see, Windows was installed successfully. We have our program manager and all the default Windows apps installed. But the screen is quite small. So let's go ahead and fix that. Insert the Diamond Stealth 64 VRAM driver disk, go to File Manager, you see the CD-ROM drive here? Select the A drive and double click install.exe. The installation process is pretty straightforward. Monitor is not configured. Wow, that's what we're here to do. Now that we're in the display driver settings window, in the monitor model drop down list, select user defined monitor. Once the user defined monitor modes window appears, select any 60 Hz modes in the available modes list, such as 640x480, 800x600, 1024x768, and 1152x864. This is as far as it'll go in true color mode. Before exiting, make sure the desktop size and viewport size resolutions match. If you want to use 1024x768 for instance, you'll want to set both settings to that resolution. The colors displayed can be changed in the color depth setting, where you can select 256 colors, high color mode, or true color mode depending on the resolution you choose. Once you're done making changes, click OK. That's not necessary. And restart Windows. Upon restarting right after installing the drivers, you may notice that your mouse does not move and the machine is frozen. This is nothing but a harmless bug as a hard reset fixes the problem. But aside from that, now we have a wide array of colors at our disposal on Windows. Beautiful. One of the themes I instantly switched to is the blues, as it's fairly reminiscent of the default 16 color Windows theme. Now you can see more colors, but what good is it if you can't hear? This is where the Sound Blaster 16 driver comes in. This specific driver also works on MS-DOS and has a text-based setup, which requires you to exit Windows to install. At the command line, insert disk 1 of the set and type install. You will eventually be taken to this screen where you can proceed and select begin installation. When prompted to choose which hard drive to install the drivers to, choose the hard drive with Windows installed. In that case, the C drive. From there, let the installer do its thing and switch a disk out when necessary. Now that we're done copying files, this is where you'll have to pay close attention to the settings you choose. The base I.O. and MIDI port addresses on screen must match the address and MPO 401 address that we chose in 86 boxes settings, respectively. In which case they do, so proceed. Once again, enter the C drive. This is the screen outlining the changes to autoexecute.bat and config.sys, press enter. This is the correct path for Windows. Press enter again, and again, and once we're back here, all we have to do is exit the installer and restart our machine. Back in Windows now, you'll be greeted with a message that informs you that Sound Blaster apps are about to be installed, and that you'll have to restart again. But not the entire computer this time, just Windows. And now, prepare your ears. For the faintest chimes.wave I've ever heard. 
Thankfully, this is something we can fix in either the gain settings in 86 box or the SB16 mixer app. I usually crank up the master volume in the gain and then save and exit. This generally fixes all my volume related problems. Now to test the sound. Wait, only chimes and ding were included in Windows for Workgroups 3.11? Strange, I never noticed that last time. And now for some MIDI music. Okay, we're good. Now, remember, this is Windows for workgroups. We've got to get some form of networking going on here. To do this, we'll need to start by first installing the drivers for the network card, and then we'll go on with installing the TCP IP support required for Windows to connect to the internet. Now let's go ahead and set up networking. Go to Network in Program Manager and click Network Setup. From there, click on Networks, select Install Microsoft Windows Network, and click OK. Back on the Network Setup window, click Drivers, Add Adapter, and select Unlisted or Updated Network Adapter. Now, insert the Realtek Network Driver floppy disk, and as it contains drivers for other Windows versions as well, change the path to a colon slash WFW311. If all goes well, Realtek 8029 Real PCI should appear in the box. In this network names dialog, choose whatever you want for the user and computer name, but as usual, leave workgroup as workgroup. There's just no need to change it. Are you ready for some more disk switching? There are two files in total that will need to come from the Realtek driver disk, rtl8029.386 and pcind.dos. Whenever they are requested, insert the floppy disk and change the path to a colon slash wfw311 again. The rest of the files will come from the Windows setup disks. Time to restart once again. You are now greeted by a login screen, where you can either click OK or specify a password. The latter is not necessary, so just click OK. Just know that you can always set a password later on by going to Network, Log On or Off, and the rest is self-explanatory. Okay, so we got the network adapter installed, but now we need to actually connect this machine to the internet, which can be done by installing the TCP IP protocol. In the previous installation video, we had to deal with this self-extracting executable that would extract its files into whichever folder you put it with no visual indication of progress unless you ran it in DOS. Well, no more. I managed to copy those files onto a floppy disk image that you can find a link to in the description. In Network Setup, click Drivers, Add Protocol, Unlisted or Updated Protocol, insert the TCP IP floppy disk, select the TCP IP32 protocol listed, and let the files copy. Now select the TCP IP protocol and click on Setup, which is where you'll be inputting the required IP address, DNS, gateway, and other information you needed to connect to the internet. Since we're using Slurp, you'll want to use the following information. Now enter the DNS screen, add the DNS address, click Add, then OK. Once you're done, click OK, and then restart. Now, bear in mind that we're dealing with a 30-year-old operating system on the internet, so things may not always work as expected. For example, if we go to MS-DOS prompt and attempt to ping Google servers, you can see that it does resolve www.google to an IP address, but the request times out. That's not an issue, as we now know TCP IP is actually functional on the system. One of the ways we can verifiably test our internet connection is through IRC, using the popular MIRC client. We're using version 5.82s here, as it's one of the last versions compatible with 16-bit windows. As you can see here, we're able to connect to 86 boxes IRC server, Yes, we have one link to our Discord server.
Web browsing though, <laughs> is a completely different story. In our first video, we took a look at Internet Explorer version 3.0 and the results were not so pretty. Let's see if the latest version of Internet Explorer that can run on Windows 3.1, being version 5.0, could potentially make things any better. While the installation process was fairly simple, let's just say that the web browsing experience was not exactly far from what I expected broken. Google still loads somehow and searches can still be made, but have fun trying to read 86 Box's website. There are many other alternatives for web browsing, such as installing Netscape or using something such as Browservice, but we'll leave those for another video. Despite Windows 3.1 being three decades old now, there's still so much you could do with it, ranging from running a variety of old Windows games to turning it into a retro productivity machine. Additionally, there were many extensions for Windows 3.1, such as Win32S and Video for Windows, but those can be covered in future videos. What matters now is that you have a fully functional installation of one of the most monumental Windows releases of all time. An operating system that was capable both on the surface and under the hood with its memorable user interface and ease of use alongside robust software support and other features was not something to take granted, especially 30 years ago. Windows for Workgroups 3.11 in particular was no insignificant update as it brought in a ton of features such as facilitating networking and internet access that would pave the way for its code base to be used in Windows 95, which, by the way, will be the topic of our next installation and overview video. On that note, thank you for watching, and as always, happy emulation. Oh, and I should mention that this video was in fact produced using 86box version 3.11.